and so it's 5.30, so I should begin. Uh, good evening, everybody. We will begin slowly as people come into the, into the Zoom room. Welcome to the monthly Life and Death Wellness educational webinar. Thank you for being here this evening. Life and Death Wellness is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we love getting donations and we dearly need them. This will help us provide services and education for our community. You can go to www.ldwellness.org uh, if you'd like to donate. You'll also get a follow up email that will allow you to donate as well. The core mission of Life and Death Wellness is to positively change the experience of dying and caregiving through education, support, and providing practical tools to make thoughtful decisions that inspire life, especially at the end. Life and Death Wellness, the office is right next to Minis. If you're in Kapa Ao, you'll see us right there. My name is Bobby Bryant. I am an end-of-life doula. I also facilitate end-of-life doula trainings for people who are interested in learning more about dying, death, grief, and loss, and how to care for each other at the end of life. There is an upcoming end-of-life doula training, October 17th, 15th through 17th. If you're interested, please email me at bobby at inspiredendings.org or you can inquire through Life and Death Wellness as well. So one of the ways that Life and Death Wellness uh, provides education is through these monthly webinars that we offer free to the public. Joining me this evening uh, for the uh, our conversation tonight uh, is the presentation this evening, sorry, is on spirituality at the end of life and what that looks like with our very diverse populations here on the big island. And for this conversation, I've invited Vicki Farley, who is the chaplain at North Hawaii Hospice in Waimea. And so I thought that, uh, Vicki, if you would like to talk more about yourself and how you got here, uh, we could start there and then I'll throw a little question at you and we'll start rolling. Okay, so I'm Vicki Farley. I've been a chaplain for 21 years. The first seven were in acute care, working in hospitals, and the last have been in hospice. I was in hospice in Portland, Oregon for Providence Hospice for many, many years. And I did my original training to become a chaplain. I did my um, residency at the Portland VA Medical Center. So I spent a year with the veterans and that's a very interesting population just to sit with and to learn from. Mm -hmm. um, I started long ago thinking about death and and how it affects us and what we do with it. Um, I was six years old and my baby sister died and she was my baby. She lived in my room and I got to take care of her. And, um, you know, back in 1964, they couldn't do surgery until she was a year old. She was missing a bile duct and had a hole in her heart. And so she made it nine months. She didn't make it to the year. And later in life, I became a hospice volunteer because we had a family friend that wouldn't let anybody in to see him. I thought, well, if I get trained, maybe he will let me in. So I became a volunteer and he actually did let me in. And I was able to convince him that people didn't care what he looked like. They didn't care that he couldn't talk a lot. They just wanted to share with him and be present to him. So we finally let in three or four of his friends. And then I went to get my master's in pastoral ministry from Seattle University. And part of that, I was 
my internship was as a chaplain at Virginia Mason. And there's no thing on your name tag that says in training, it just says chaplain. <laughs> so when they send you out, you are it. Um, at the end of that year, I said, no way on God's green earth am I ever going to do this. Don't ever tell God never, <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> so 20 years later, or maybe not that long, but um, I had the opportunity to go back and get my clinical pastoral education, which was at the VA. And I've been doing it for 21 years now. And so that's um, how I got here. Um, my husband died three years ago, three and a half, three and a half years ago. And I spent a year in Portland after he died where we lived. And then I decided he and I had always said we were going to either go to Palm Springs or Hawaii. And I said, it's just me, I can go either place. So I chose to come to Hawaii. And so I've been here, I've been in Hawaii two and a half years now. So that's how I got here. Oh my goodness. Well, an amazing um, years of experience that you have. And I love that you said, nope, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> and here you are. And here I, I am. I can remember being in the office at North Hawaii Hospice with the executive director and her telling me how excited she was that you had applied for this position. And so I got to hear a bit about you. Uh, before you were hired and you arrived. And I had my fingers crossed as well. And I know that everybody that, um, you know, that you come in contact with, that we hear from is so very grateful that you're here. So um, wonderful, wonderful beginning. I would like to say that uh, for anybody who has questions, that we'll take questions at the end, just remember to put them in the chat box. And then we'll tend to them about 10 or 15 minutes before um, the program ends. So um, Vicki, you know, I, I came to see you about a week and a half ago and I had some questions for you. And I know one of the things I've been so curious about um, because we have such a diverse island. I mean, Hawaii is very diverse in ethnicity, race, culture, religion, it's so diverse. And so I think about this concerning end of life care. And I think, wow, what's the most important thing for people that have you know, different religious beliefs at the end of life? And what about spirituality and how does all of this go together um, to provide people with support for what they really need at the end of life? And so I had a lovely conversation with you about this. And so I thought also maybe you could talk about what's the difference between spirituality and religion, because often people you uh, interchange them, you know, they use them as the same. So. If you would like to just talk about those things, it's going to be fascinating, I'm sure. So. so I'll start off with the diversity of our islands. Over half of Hawaii does not affiliate with any tradition. So 51% say we're not anything. 28% say they're Christian, 9% um, said they were Buddhist. I actually thought that would be higher um, based on my practice. We have a higher percentage, I think, in the north end of the island over that. Um, other is 10%. Um, Judaism is less than 1%. But when it comes to really thinking about what we need and do at the end of life, it's 100% different for each person. Each person is your, each of us is our own. Because I can ask you, what religion are you? And when I ask religion, I'm asking, are you affiliated with an organized, formal faith tradition? So religion is just that, a faith and worship community that's more formalized. And I get Catholic, Mormon, um, Jehovah Witness, 
congregational imiola. But that's those titles are just an umbrella. Because if I ask you, you tell me you're Catholic. It doesn't tell me what you really believe about that. Or is that important to you? Or are you Catholic because your parents were Catholic? Or are you Catholic but have not practiced for 50 years? Or are you devout in traditional prayers and sacraments and like more conservative ways of practicing the Catholic faith? Or are you more evangelical in your practice? So when you tell me one name, it gets me on the ball field, but it doesn't tell me what position you play. Right. Um, and then if I ask you, what's your spirituality? I'm really asking, what is it that centers you? What do you hold sacred? What is holy to you? And again, I can ask 10 people and get 10 different answers. Because how we see ourselves and how we center ourselves is different for each of us. But also there's this piece of human beings that when I ask them, what about your spirit? What about your spirituality? They've never thought about it. They can't answer the question because they've been so busy living life with, you know, yeah, you're raising a family, you're making sure the house is paid, you know, you have all these things. They play sports, they do all this stuff, but they've never sat down to say, what is truly important to me? What is it that centers me? What do I hold sacred? And when you don't think about it, you, you can't answer it. That takes thought and it takes looking inside to see what, what is that? And once they start thinking about it, when I asked them like this morning, we had a new person come on to our hospice service. And I simply asked, what is the most important to you right now? First of all was pain. How do we help him get out of pain? Second was, how do I do this with my family? I have two young daughters. How, how do we make this work? How do I die here at home and hold them in this place as well? And how do I, how do I share my legacy with them? How do I, how do I share what's really important in life? How do I share my beliefs? How do I share my philosophy of life? What meaning does my life have right now? And what meaning do I want it to have? And that meaning of what I want it to have is the legacy part. So that's, what I, that's where I focus, is what's important to you right now? How do you want to live these days, you may have one day, you may have five years left, we don't know. So how do you want to live? How do you want to live these days you have right now? I had one patient that wanted to live them sitting down at the Coast Guard station, reading his poetry. Mm. That's what he wanted. And I had to get that out of him because I knew he had a favorite place. And I said, if something happens to you, where do I start looking? <laughs> so he finally told me. And that's what he'd love to do. <laughs> and when he couldn't go to the beach anymore, then I would read to him. Mm. Because that was important to him to stay connected to that poetry that sang, sang to his heart. Mm. Um, so each one is so very different, but the important piece is to ask, ask your loved one or ask yourself, 
what is it that's really important to me? What is it that I want to pass on? What is it? How do I want to be remembered? And is that important to you? Maybe it's not. And what I usually find is that it boils down to our relationships. How am I in my relationship with my spouse, my children, my friends, my community, myself, my God, whatever I call that greater being outside of myself. I say God because that's what it is to me, but people have different names or concepts of what that is. And I don't know unless I ask. And sometimes they look at me like I'm crazy because it's like, no one's ever asked me that. <laughs> so why do you need to know that? It's like, I just wanna be on the same page as you. If I'm going to walk alongside you, I wanna know something important about you. What is it that gives you life? And what is it that holds you tight and embraces you? And what is it you want to embrace and how? And how? So that's. These are such beautiful questions that, like you said, they really speak to the heart of what are we doing here? What have we been doing here? And what is, what is deeply important to us? And um, so I'm wondering, do you find that when you ask people this, uh, you know, some people, like you said, some people haven't thought about this. Um, they've mm -hmm. been busy doing their life. Nobody's ever asked them before, and they never mm -hmm. had any reason that to inquire with themselves. And so I wonder when you ask some people, it seems to me, because people, of course, they come on to hospice, some people die really quickly. So you ask somebody who maybe is 24 hours, you know, they've got less than 24 hours, we don't know. Huh? And then there's people, of course, that live a lot longer. And it, so it seems to me, wow, the people that have a lot longer, if they want, then you have a process Thank with you. them. There's right. time. But what about these people who have no time? And you ask this question and they're imminent. How does if that work? When they come on and it's imminent when they come on, I don't ask that question. You're right. It's too they late. don't have time. They don't have time to think about it. Yeah. But what I do ask is what's important to you right now? Right. You know, what's important to you right now? Is there someone that you want to talk to? Is there a voice you want to hear? Are there sacraments or rituals that you want that are important to you right now? What is it you need in this moment? And oftentimes when they come on and they're imminent like that, they can't answer me. So I'm asking these questions of the family. Yes. And you won't believe how many children do not know anything about that part of their parents' life. The adult children don't know. So Ooh. if you're out there and you still got your parents, ask them, please because it's an important piece to share and to know for, for the end, because how are we going to keep them comfortable and, and know what's important to them? Like if they are a religious tradition, do they want the sacrament of the sick? Do they want viaticum? Do they want church blessing? Do they want the, someone to sit Kaddish after when they die. What, what is it that's important of, of that faith, that, that system that they've grown up with? The other piece of that is our dementia patients. They can't answer those questions. I take that back. They can answer those questions. It's just done differently. Because they can tell me what they like. Uh -huh. You know, if I ask religion or spirituality, that kind of doesn't fit. But what is it you like? What did you, did you like to read? Did you like to sing? Did you like to, what is it? Did you, did you pray? What did you do when you were a little boy or a little girl? 
you know, I just had one that when she came on service, her children told me, well, she doesn't, she wasn't anything. And then in the last two weeks, they called me up and said, oh, she was Catholic. And I said, when she was young. And I said, so do you think she would, do you think she's waiting for like the priest to come? Well, we don't know. And I said, well, what if I invite him to come give, provide the sacraments? And maybe that will help her because they couldn't figure out why she was still hanging on. Right. And I said, well, let's start with that piece. <laughs> that was an important piece to know. Yes. And even, especially with dementia, what, what did they practice when they were young? Not what they practiced the last 10 years because their mind is probably beyond that time, right? Yes. What did they practice when they were young? Let's start there and see if that's important to them. Mm. I had one lady that all she could do was count in her dementia. She counted to 10 all the time but she also carried around a, a, a baby doll so to me okay so evident she was good with numbers at some point in her life but this baby was important to her mm -hmm. so we would sit with the baby and she, once she trusted me she would offer me to hold the child oh my goodness and I would hold it and sing and give it back. Of course, I can't sing with beans, but she would start singing then. And she would take the baby back and rock. But it was nurturing. She needed to nurture something that was important to her. And that was important to know so that she could have those moments of feeling whole again. And whatever that meant in that particular time. Right. Oh my goodness, that is so important. There are so many people with dementia. Yeah. So this information for families to know, you know, that you're really looking further back. Yeah. Of course, for, for you as well, for whoever is um, providing support. I love the, the clues, right? The counting, okay. She's counting, so counting was very important to her. Important, yeah. The baby, the baby doll, you know, so working yeah. with what you've got, looking for the clues, going deep yeah. into the past and starting to inquire to see if what was done back then still has great meaning. Right. Mm. And they, they will let you know either their blank stare because mm. it's like, what are you talking about? Or they'll scowl. It's like, okay, maybe that wasn't a good part in, of your life. Or they'll smile. I mean, they will somehow give you a clue. Right. Are you on the right path? Right. And the path changes for all of us. So if I'm on the same, if I'm talking with you, Bobby, uh -huh. and all of a sudden you're going, what the heck are you talking about? It's <laughs> like, then we change paths. You know, we move on to something different. It's, right, right. Yeah. It's the inquiry. It's the gentle yeah. inquiry that's important. That I'm, I'm curious I, about yeah. how I can support you and how is it that I can help provide you with some sense of your own sense of peace right. yeah. so that you can die in peace. And I think, yeah, it's that way really for all of us. What is it that we need to attend to so that we can find peace, yeah. whatever that means. Whatever that means. And yeah. a part of that is finding out what rituals work for you. Rituals aren't, aren't religious necessarily, they can be. Uh huh. But look at athletes, they have rituals, right. you know, touchdown. What's the ritual that they do? You know, someone's out there dancing and they have a particular dance they do, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Baseball players, when they get up to bat, they have a ritual, whatever it is, you know, they have, we all have rituals. How do you get dressed in the morning? Mm -hmm. You put your left sock on and then your right sock? Yeah. And what happens if you do a right sock and then left sock? Does it make you feel different? Uh-huh. So we all have rituals of varying degrees, you know? So 
you know, what rituals bring you comfort? Is it the ritual of reading scripture? What, what does that mean for you? That for me, it means curling up in the corner of the couch with a well-worn Bible and my cup of tea or hot chocolate. And then I'm ready. Right. Um, for my grandma, it was afternoon having her diet, have her, her Coke with lemon, lemon juice in it and talking with me. Right. That was, we had that, we did that all the time. Um, for some people it's um, rote prayers, repetition. Um, for some it's singing, it's, so when I sit down to help them plan their either funeral service or their home going or celebration of life or whatever it is you want to call it, awake, what is it, what do you want people to do or say, or how do you want them to feel? You know, when I die, my niece and nephew already know what song they're supposed to play, unbeknownst to anybody else in the church, because it's not an accepted church practice. Oh. The um, na 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 hey, hey, hey goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big hockey fan, and that's what you play at the end of the games all the time, right? <laughs> And it's also my way of saying, bye, I'm not going to miss you guys. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm heading to the next adventure. <laughs> so that's what's important to me. Let you know that this is an adventure and I'm on it and I'm good. Don't worry about me. I'm good. Okay. So that's my ending ritual. Mm -hmm. So to find out what's your ending ritual, what, would, what do you want it to be? Right. right. And it doesn't have to be serious. It can be fun. Yes, exactly. And the reason I have my niece and nephew doing it is because they're not going to know any of the priests or anybody at my service, so they can get away with it. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> they'll also my rebellion. Will they be singing? I, it? Will they put the music on? They'll they'll play a tape of it. Yeah, that's it? yeah, that's yeah. great. And and yeah. sing along. I love that. I love you know, that. And love knowing that. my nephew, he'll put it under. Humor. My nephew will put it someplace where no one can get blamed for it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, like of having a sense of humor at the, you know, is important. It. Yeah, exactly. Through the through this, that is easy. Dying is hard. Yes. Yeah, that process of getting from this point in life to no life. Right. That section is the hard part. Yes. And that's where we need each other to walk alongside, to laugh, to cry, to joke, to sing, to dance, to go sit on the rock and listen to the waves. Yes. That's I agree. What's important. Make, it all, make it all okay. Make it okay. You know, to know that this is something we all do. None of us are alone in this. We're no. in it together. We... We do yeah. our individual dying, but it happens to all of us and we can all relate to yeah. it. We give ourselves the chance to talk about it and support each other and laugh and cry and everything in between, get it's, angry, whatever it means. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Relate on it. <laughs> yeah, and the relationship part is the most important. Your relationship with yourself, your God, your family, the larger community, those relationships are the most important. Yes. That is my experience as well with um, all of the people that I have been with in the end. That is what is in people's hearts. Those, that's who people, that's what people are con the con most concerned about. And I've found that if they're concerned about maybe family members who have um, an argument that I may be like siblings that, you know, mom may, might hang on because she to wants try. that to try yeah. to see, can that be resolved? Please love yeah. each other, right? Yeah. Don't be angry. I'm waiting for you to do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And people wait for strange things. Um, right. 
people die the way they live for the most part. There are conversions at the end where they change, but not really. Most of them die the way they live. And we had one lady, late 80s, and she was dead. She did, her body just didn't know to give up. And I finally asked her sister, I said, what did your sister do when she got ready to go out? Well, she always fixed her hair. She always put on her makeup and she had her purse with her. And I said, where's her purse? So she brought in her purse. The nurse and I fixed her hair. The CNA put on her makeup and she died like an hour later. Uh, she couldn't go out messed up. Right, right. You know? So what's your rituals? What are important, right. what's important to you? She couldn't meet her God without being proper. Right. Having her lipstick on, the right shoes, the right outfit, the purse. I'm ready. Yeah. Presentable yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah. So it's important to notice. Notice with your parents and your friends. Notice what are their rituals for little things. Yes. And ask the question. Yes. Ask the question. Yeah. yeah. You know, if they were grumpy in life, they're probably going to be grumpy in death, you know, right. yeah. so of a lifetime. I think, it, I, you know, it, it, it's challenging there to change, I think, at the very at the very end, because we, yeah, the habit it's ingrained the habit in us. of a mind of a whole lifetime of ritual yeah. ways of relating to life. Yeah. You know, I had this one gentleman that kept telling me, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And I said, it's okay, I love you. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I said, it's okay, I love you. And finally, he looks at me and goes, why do you love me? <laughs> I said, because you're a grumpy old man. And he just busted up a gut laughing. And we were, we were able to be friends in that journey after that. Uh, oh, that's great. You know? So you can challenge people at the end as well. You know, I just flat out told him, you're a grumpy old man. Mm -hmm. Right. And, the, and he, clearly he appreciated it. He's like, oh, here's somebody no, who's willing to tell me the truth. <laughs> no one stood up to him. They were all tiptoeing around him. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, my goodness. You know, so it's important to just be who you are yeah. with who they are. Right. And to be true and honest, just to be honest. Yes. And you don't have to be brutally honest. You know, I, I tell little white lies around, the, you know, because it doesn't really matter. If, right. if, especially with a dementia patient who asks me, where's my husband who died 50 years ago? I usually just say, I think he's still at work mm. or he's running an errand because who knows what, what he's doing in the afterlife, you know, or what that looks like for him. All I know is that he's not right here. And if I tell her that he's dead, she's going to remember that grief all over again. Yes, exactly. Cause she doesn't, cause it will be new to her each time. Right. You know? Yeah. So they're not exactly fibs, but they're not exactly the truth either. <laughs> yeah, but they're they're not harmful. They're not harmful. They're not harmful. They're in order to support a person who yeah. has dementia in yeah. in having peace and not being distressed about something that there's nothing they can do nothing about. Can and do. in a few minutes, they're going to forget again. Right. Wow. So yeah. yeah. You know, Vicky, I wonder about like meaning making, you know, about um, you know, people, the, just the exercise of helping people reflect on their life and thinking about mm -hmm. how feeling that can be as well. Do you help people with that too? We do, we do that. Um, and you have a great program, Mo'olelo Project. Yes. That's a beautiful project to help people share their life story. Yes. To talk story is important. Um, meaning, meaning making is like, I've helped people journal, mm -hmm. you know, we start with a few questions here and there, um, like who, who, who do you want to read this 
if you want anybody to read it, because it doesn't have to be for anybody else. It can be just for you as well. Mm -hmm. But if you want it for someone else, what is it you want them to know about you? So it's kind of leading into the legacy part. Right. But the meaning making is, tell me the most important thing you've done in life. What is it that's been important to you that you've done? And how, what was that impact? Hmm. on you, on anybody else? What was that impact? Your life did have meaning. Look at, look at, look at what that did for many, many people. Your life did have meaning. Um, so important. Writing letters, meaning making and writing letters to loved ones, also a leading into legacy. They kind of they don't always go hand in hand, but they merge often, oftentimes, mm -hmm. the meaning making and the legacy piece. Right. But the meaning making is really helping people understand what value did their life have while they lived on this earth? Yes. Because I had people tell me I didn't do anything. I didn't have an impact. I didn't do this. And so I look at what the clues in the room, check the clues in the room like you know there's a picture over there with some people in it tell me about those people who are they to you and who are you to them and it's like oh you just told me that that was a really good friend and that you spent a lot of time fishing with them and and helping them build their home without you that home wouldn't be what it is today you did have meaning Yes. Your life had meaning in that relationship. Yes. And again, relationships, that's where your meanings are. Yeah, I think so often people forget that the effect that they have on everybody they meet and in a lifetime, that's many, many, many. A lot of people. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you can look at the milestones, right? You know, yeah. that are usually really meaningful for pe people, you know, we can touch mm -hmm. on those, but yeah, it seems like, you know, you, if you could just ask them about one or two, and then all of a sudden it can just bring up all yeah. of the different stories so that they can actually feel that, you know, to be reminded, yeah. like you just said, oh, wow, that person wouldn't have been able to do that without you. And then their family wouldn't have had that home either. And so you affected them as well. To help them remember, yes, I am connected. I, my life has had meaning. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. There we go. So then there's that, that, that piece of peace, I think, that it can provide. That it can bring. Yeah, knowing, yeah. knowing that one was connected in life. I think sometimes at the end of life, people can get depressed and, you know, that, that can lead to this forgetting, this mm -hmm. feeling like, what was it all for? And so we need people yeah. to, to remind us, like you and family and whoever is around. You know, there's this saying, uh, what is it? You know, the uh, gentleman, I think Arn Garborg, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his oh. name right, but I think what he said was to love someone is to learn the song in their heart, in their heart. and to yes. sing it back to them when they have forgotten. And I yes. feel that that's part of our responsibility at the end of life, to learn yes. what the song was in their heart, right? Through their life, and then sing. And sing it back. Yeah. Another thing is to gaze in someone's eyes and have them gaze Gaze mm. back. Yes. Just, and it does something, it builds a connection that's totally different on a different level. But to gaze into someone's eyes and just pour out that love through your eyes, the caring, the appreciation, whatever it is you have for that person, and just, just connect that way. And it's, it's very powerful to I, do. I, I totally agree. I feel like it's 
And I like it. I see you. I, I really yes. see you. And I, ex and I yeah. accept whoever yes. you are, whatever, whatever you are, I accept yeah. you. I care about you. And to really, to really be able to transmit that through the eyes and even, you know, just through you know, just the whole way that you look at somebody, that connection, I think that connection throughout all of life is important, but especially there at the end when people might be yeah. feeling very alone. Um, yeah. And they, some have regrets that they've never voiced. Yes. And to be able to sit with that. And sometimes they don't want to tell me because sometimes I ask them, do you have regrets? Do we do, you know, is there something that needs to be talked about? Oh, you won't like me if you, if you heard it. It's like, you know what? I don't have to like what you did. I do have to love you. You know, what you did is your actions. I don't have to like your actions, but I still love you. There's a difference between your actions and, and, and who you are. Yes. yes. And so that's also been a very powerful piece when we're talking about regrets. It's like regrets are part of life. I mean, we don't all, you know, the saints didn't become saints because they were saintly their whole life. Right. <laughs> you know, the saints become <laughs> saints because they changed and grew and yeah. Yeah, they they made mistakes. They made lots of mistakes. They made lots of mistakes, and then they yeah. learned from them. And they learned and changed and grew from it. Grew exactly. And yeah. isn't that um, the story of the opportunity that we all have? Yes. You know, when somebody that we're with at the end of life has regrets. Well, I can I can relate. I've made mistakes in my life as well. I I understand and. Yeah. But I also we know, oh, how, how much it will provide a sense of peace for them if they can just trust and say, yeah. this is what happens, right? Yeah. And you just accept them and love them. Do. Yeah. We just love them. And that's, it's okay. Mm. They don't have to love back. Right. But I, have, but I have to love. That's just part of who I am. Yes. And I'm not going to deny that. You know, I'm. You're not going to hold that back. <laughs> I'm not going to hold it back. You don't have to love me back. It's just, I cannot not love you. Right. You know. Mm, so beautiful. Such important work um, that you do. I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering um, about, about, do you ever have people ask you, um, especially maybe, you know, like Hawaiians, like about the practice of Ho'oponopono? Is that something um, that comes Evidently not, because I don't know what it means. <laughs> so what, what does it mean? Yeah. Ah, okay. What does it mean? Um, well, it's uh, it's definitely it's um, it's an old Haw it's an ancient Hawaiian practice, and Dr. Ira Bayak um, he spoke about it a lot. But I think so. There's four the, um, to the there's this uh, kind of like a beautiful process of forgive. I'm sorry. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Thank yes. you. Forgive me. I forgive I'm you. Forgive you. Right. Yes. So you know, I don't know it by the Hawaiian name, but I know right. I know Ira Bayak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's the process we walk, we walk through. Right. You know. What what are you sorry for? What are you grateful for? What do you need to forgive? And who do you need to forgive? Like, and that includes yourself. Yes. There's a lot that we hold against ourselves that no one else does. They've forgotten it. Right. So yeah, mm. yeah. So I was just gonna look and see um, if there were any, if anybody has any questions, we can take some time to answer those questions. Um, and uh, 
So far, nobody has any questions and that's okay. Uh, that's all right. We'll, um, we'll just keep going. And uh, if people want to chime in, then they can. Um, and so we have about another 10 minutes where we can talk about what's deeply meaningful for people. And yeah, I guess, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, going back to, um, gosh, I remember, you know, wh about what's deeply meaningful. And Vicki, you told me a story, I think about a woman who was a Jehovah's Witness and what was deeply meaningful for her. Um, do you remember that? The, I've got a couple, but I think I know. Okay, okay. When it came time for her to die, because I know the Jehovah Witness don't believe in resurrection the same that I do. And it was like, I, I was trying to connect with what she would know. And I said, what does it mean for you? What does, what does heaven or afterlife mean for you? And she goes, it means I can rest. I can rest in the earth. I can be embraced by the earth. I don't have to get up and take care of anybody. I can rest and be held. Mm. And that's, that was okay with her. Right. She wanted to walk into that cave, that womb, and just be. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love that. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm thinking about um, a gentleman that um, that I that I'm with uh, about once a week, and uh, just thinking about you know he he told me I've been with him for you know over a year now. He's you yeah. know terminal end of life and. Um, you know, he has said to me, you know, Bobby, I'm not, I'm not religious at all. And so yeah. I don't know, you know, I don't have any. And I said, you know, and so I said, yeah, that's okay. And he said, and I don't think I'm spiritual at, at either. And so, you know, we started having this conversation about, mm -hmm. well, what's important for you? And, you know, here we are. He, this is a gentleman who thought that he was going to die. He probably no longer than two months right and um here we are we're definitely over a year yeah maybe even a year and a year and four months maybe now and i have seen that what is deeply meaningful for him are his relationships every week he doesn't have any he doesn't have any grown children right I, he has a couple of family members on the mainland, but every week he has four to five people that come and see him and talk story with him and play yeah. games with him. And I'm one of those people who yeah. get to play games with him. And this yeah. is what's really meaningful. It's I really mean, important to him. It's so important. This is how yeah. I connect. This is how I yeah. want to go out. You know, relating, yeah. relating to people, laughing and talking story and playing games that, you know, he, he often, it's so funny, um, you know, he often loses and he doesn't care. Not I don't it, care. Not it's not about it. It's not about yeah. that. You know, he just, he could have made it about it if he wanted to. Some people mm -hmm. are really competitive, but oh, he, very, yeah. He, yeah, he doesn't care. He's like, no, I'm here with you. Let's yeah. have, you know, let's have some lemonade and let's play this game and laugh. Yeah. I, yeah. I love that. So much appreciation yeah. for people finding whatever it is. Whatever it is, it connects them. Yeah. yeah. You know? Because when somebody tells me they're not spiritual, I said, you don't have a spirit about you. Uh -huh. You don't have... I said, you're not feisty. You don't have a feisty spirit. You don't have, you know, I push. Right. Because you know, we all have a spirit of some kind, mm -hmm. which makes us spiritual beings. Yes. But it's, people just don't think about it that way. Right. They just, they don't think, when they think spiritual, they're still thinking holy, sacred, which is true. 
but they're thinking outside and not inside. Yes. So what is it that's inside you that keeps you going? Yeah. What is it that centers you? What is it that holds you to this earth? Yeah. Or what is it springboarding? What, what springboard you have to whatever comes next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was this one lovely gentleman that was on hospice care. He, he died a few months ago. But um, one of the things that was most important for him was to dance naked out in his yard <laughs> under the moon. <laughs> And that's okay. That's it, exactly what he needed to connect. Yeah. That was his connection. Right. That was his that connection. Felt, yes, that he felt comfortable enough to say that. And this to is what do, I need. Yeah, yeah, that we, like you said, that we look inside and we honor that which is deeply important to us, no matter what yeah, no matter. anybody else might think. We no. need to be. Well, my idea anyways is to be true to myself be true yes. to my spirit this is my one life i don't know i don't know what comes after I don't know what comes I don't know. i'm open we'll see <laughs> i just figure it's another adventure another you know, adventure exactly. whatever it is <laughs> so yeah whatever whatever we can do um to to help people in that way and um Vicki, is it is it everybody that um, that do you visit everybody? Does everybody want a chaplain or no. no? No. No. I've got one that I called today to offer again. I had offered once and she had said no. So uh -huh. but something had come up and so I just called to offer again and she goes, Really? No, I'm friends with God. I don't need a chaplain. It's like, okay. She goes, I'll call when I need you. And I said, okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> It's okay. And I have others that are like, even saying I'm a chaplet or a spiritual counselor, it's like taboo. It's like, you're not coming in here. I was like, right. I had, when I was at the VA, I had a gentleman say, you can't, you, I'm not converting. I said, that's not my job. Right. And he looks at me and goes, what do you mean? I said, I'm just here to be for you. If you want to convert, that's your work. Right. Not mine. Yeah. And then he let me visit. But I mean, a lot of it's like, don't come near me. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. But most folks. Questions. Yeah. Most folks are open to having me at least come and be with them. Uh huh. And once we get past the title, you know, it's fine. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because they're able to see you for the beautiful human that you are that's showing up for them in however they want to be. And however they want to be. <laughs> then it's then it's all good. But yeah, sometimes people might think, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, we're not going there. She's gonna convert me or I'm in trouble for something. <laughs> I, I didn't do it. <laughs> it's like well, if you didn't do it, I probably did. So we're in the same boat. We're right. good. I I was um I was with a patient once who uh I, I had asked him like, hey, have you seen, you know, has, has Vicky the chaplain come by to see you? And he's like, oh no, 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 that's not necessary. And, and I said, oh no, you should talk to her. She's really cool. She's a good time. You should you should have her. He's like, really? And I said, yeah, she's just a, she's a human being. She's a great, you know, she's a great person. And uh I think you'll really enjoy your time with her if you if you allow her in. So I think he did. <laughs> Thank you for the for the push. Because <laughs> sometimes that's all it takes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it just takes someone else knowing and, yeah. and helping to open the door. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, Vicki, it's um it's six twenty five, and uh, I know we're supposed to end at six thirty, and so I just want to take the opportunity to um, ask you: Is there anything else that you would like to say uh, before we? I end? think the most important thing is don't be afraid to ask the questions. Yes. Doesn't, don't be afraid to ask the question, and to hold to hold the answers that you get. Just there's this sacred bowl that we create. 
and it holds all those answers and all the questions. And just don't be afraid to ask the question. So important. I think also a reason that I think about um, is that we don't get that opportunity again. Yeah. If we don't take the opportunity to be curious, to ask the question, to say what needs to be said, to encourage people to say the things, that opportunity will not happen again. Not they, again. they will die. And I certainly have sat next to people on airplanes, been in everywhere and talked to people who have those regrets, who said, oh my gosh, if I'd only known, or I didn't think you were going to die right away, or, you know, all of, all of those things. It's like, yeah, this is it. It's not a dress rehearsal. Go for nope. it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Vicki Farley. Thank you for inviting me it was great to talk with you thank you uh, a lovely conversation and um, you know this webinar is going to be available for people to listen to uh, there'll be a reminder uh, email that will come and then you can always go on to life and death wellness um, that's ldwellness.org and find all of the webinars all of the educational oh, webinars cool that we offer. Um, yeah, just free, free education. So there's a lot of good stuff on there. And um, again, um, we need your support. Uh, just like the last slide says here. I love that slide with I think that's a $100 bill in that jar. <laughs> um, please donate. We're, we're here to help the community. And so when you provide donations, that means that people who do not have the finances to get support, that we can indeed support them because we have a fund in order to do that. It also helps keep the lights on in the center. It helps keep our organization running so that we can continue doing these things. So um, please tell others about um, about life and death wellness and please tell others about North Hawaii hospice and the wonderful chaplain and please tell others also about inspired endings uh, again I offer end of life doula trainings for people who are interested in doing some deeper work on their own death dying grief loss what it means to be a human who's going to die and to prepare for that. And then how do we do that for each other? I think Ram Das said, uh, we're all just walking each other home. That's the truth. So uh, please join our mailing list as well. And so on that note, um, I would just like to say uh, aloha and aloha. forward to seeing you next time. Look forward to seeing you, Vicki, when I do, which and you won't do. be too long, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.